When it comes to Marxism, socialist systems tend to have a problem with them constantly leading down the path to corrupt dictatorships and other authoritarian disasters. It's kind of a twisted irony, really, that this system supposedly designed to give us equality keeps giving us one of the most unequal types of societies in terms of power dynamics between the people and the state. Mao's China, Stalin's Russia, Castro's Cuba, Kim Il-sung's North Korea, just to name some. Whenever a country follows the ideology of Marxist-Leninism, or similar enough such as Juche where it really doesn't really matter, it somehow keeps giving us a totalitarian state. So at least from a historical perspective, this problem they have with totalitarianism has plenty of examples and is fairly indisputable. Unless, of course, you want to get into the fun conspiracy theories about how all the problems that historians largely agree on actually never happened and are all evil capitalist pig propaganda. Yet, the reason for these disasters seem to continue to fly right over the heads of Marxists every single time as they find ways to blame everything but their own terrible ideology for this consistent track record of epic failure. The Marxist system either fails to gain traction or leads to a dictatorship, and it is, of course, everyone else's fault but the Marxists and their system. So more importantly than the fact that history shows these totalitarian governments coming into existence is the simple question, why? Why does it do this? Why does this happen? Why does socialism seem so predisposed to this awful conclusion? It is, after all, been trying to give us equality, and yet it doesn't. It's an important question for those of us to ask why it happens if we want to be critical of Marx and be fair, because we have to ask this otherwise we would be just as guilty of outcome bias as they are when they claim, oh, we didn't get our desired outcome of communist utopia, therefore we, it wasn't true socialism, our Marxist-Leninist concepts must not have been implemented correctly, you know, the whole nonsense of that. So really, why does Marxism lead us to totalitarianism? Why does the pipeline exist, and how does it work? To summarize, the pipeline is composed of three major elements that feed off each other in a way that continuously grants the state more and more power. First, it strips people of their individual identity and replaces it with collectivist identity, making people subservient, unquestioning of authority, and easy to control via propaganda and social shaming. Second, it forcibly transfers ownership of private property to the state under the misguided belief that the state will use this power for the good of equality. Spoiler alert, they won't. Third, it creates an anti-competitive economic environment as people become increasingly disallowed from any kind of investment that would compete with the state's control of enterprise, sometimes just banning all private enterprise outright. Now with the basics out of the way, we can go more in detail with how these issues are interconnected. And we can start with collectivism, which is the prioritization of the group over the individual. And it isn't exactly as noble as it claims to be, as the individual is the smallest minority possible. It's logically impossible for it to be anything else. This sacrifice of the individual kind of puts a dent in the socialist claims of fighting for the good of minorities, as anybody who claims to fight for minorities while ignoring the individual is a liar. Collectivism fails the individual quite harshly, in fact, as evidenced by when Mao Zedong enslaved his own people for the good of the collective into forced labor. But it's also a concept that fails on a logical level even when used to judge individuals. Take this simple thought experience. Say you have a basket of apples, and you pull one apple out. Now, for determining how many dents the apple in your hand has, do you observe the individual apple that is in your hand, or do you look at the entire basket of apples and average out the dents of all the apples and determine the number of dents by the collective. If you guess that looking at the individual apple in your hand is a more accurate measure of the traits of the individual apple in your hand than the collective of apples, congratulations, you have made it over the fallacy of division hurdle and are thus smarter than most Marxists. Don't pat yourself on the back too hard though, it's not exactly a high bar. Okay, maybe I'm being too harsh. Most Marxists actually are capable of understanding what a fallacy of division is and why assumptions about the individual from an investigation of the collective are not exactly good arguments. But what Marxists certainly do have trouble understanding is what this specifically implies about collectivism. It shows us that the collective does not exist. No, really, it doesn't. At least not as anything more than a representational concept born from averages. Only individuals are capable of thoughts, opinions, and free will. The collective is not, because it's not a real thing. The collective is thus just a made-up entity of said thoughts and opinions that were originally created by individuals. But on a tangible level, it is simply not there. It is not something you can talk 
talk to, you can't speak with the collective, you can't think with the collective, does not have any will nor any physical presence in any way. This creates a very large problem for socialism when it reaches a section of its scheme that involves seizing means of production, and then transferring that means of production to collective ownership. Because the collective doesn't actually exist, this really just means government owning the means of production. People joining hands in a circle and singing kumbaya hard enough does not cause some collective phantom to pop out and then fairly divvy out the means of production. It is a representational concept and nothing more. So how does a concept own anything? Well, the reality is it doesn't, at least not without being represented by something that is tangible and real and thus actually can own something. I in other words, government, the part of socialism that is defined as means of production for collective ownership, really just means the government owns the means of production. And then the so-called collective can just sit back and hope that the government does the right thing with their newfound authoritarian power power out of the goodness of their hearts, and then gives all their power back to people once they are done with the revolution because the government is just such a great, good, and cuddly, and trustworthy savior of us all, yeah. Spoiler reminder, those in control of the state are not going to do the right thing. Of course they won't. Why would they? The revolutionaries mistakenly believe that the power they give to the state is some kind of temporary thing. They think it will eventually fade and be given to the collective to achieve communist utopia. This of course will never happen, because the collective does not exist. The day that the state will be dissolved will thus never come. In fact, this is where things get really bad and lead to the second problem of media control and how it contributes to how socialism creates dictatorships. Because once the government has such a high level of ownership and control over private property, this generally includes the media. And this is where the connection lies between the collectivist brainwashing and state ownership of the means of production. Once all news is controlled by the state, the people living under this false utopia are then hoisted in kind of a post-truth world where nothing is real anymore. We can observe this in modern times in the absolutely insane statements that are still being made today by the North Korean media, such as their propaganda that their dear leader's emotions can control the weather like he's some kind of Marvel superhero, or claims about the state of the nation's economy, often telling their citizens that they are in a much better position in comparison to the rest of the world than they actually are. Things like they live in a utopia and everybody else is living poor when reality is exactly the opposite. It's quite nuts. You also get blatant demonization of dissenters, leading to the complete abolishment of free speech. That's out the window. Any attempts to criticize either the government or the media in this post-truth world can now cost you your life. Eventually it gets to a point where the people living in this society have no choice but to accept this false unreality or face destruction. Because if they do know what's real, they best keep it to themselves. Because at this stage of the game, if you speak out about what's going on, you'll be labeled as a far-right tendency opportunities and probably murder. How dare you think for yourself and go against the collective Borg mind by doing so. This control over the media lets them crank up the brainwashing tenfold and further erode people's individual identity collective class warfare and collective guilt, or sometimes racial warfare and racial guilt. Anyone deemed to even be associated with those who go against the party are now painted as enemies of the state, regardless of whether or not any crime has actually been committed at the individual level. And finally, the third major issue, which is actually something that will have been brewing the entire time, the problem of competition. You see, as the government takes control over the means of production, they gain full control over the country's economy. This creates a problem because now, instead of being seen as healthy, Competition can now instead be viewed as rightist opposition to the state. An example of this was de-kulakization in Soviet Russia. If you were a kulak and owned a farm that was too big, this was considered opposition to the collective. Your farm would be seized, and you may or may not be sent to gulag. If you tried to resist, you would be flat out executed. And this bar for too big of a farm wasn't exactly that high, only about 5 acres. Imagine if you were a foreign investor watching all this nonsense happen. Or any private investor, really. Who in God's name would want to throw their hat in a market run? by murderous thieves. This means that foreign private inv enterprise and investments will end up having no interest in investing business or trading with said dictatorship either. And why would they? If you had a choice between investing into a state that will not steal ownership of your property or investing into a state that absolutely will eventually steal it, which do you pick? So thus, as the totalitarian state marches forward, the state must then start making all business investment decisions for itself. It ends up acting as sort of mega corporation, exactly what it was trying to stop. First place. Very ironic. The fox is now not only watching the hen house, it is building the hen houses and making all decisions for hens with living within the hen houses. This third issue actually has so many examples that you can open up just about any history book really about any one of the four I mentioned at the start of this video and find examples of it. It ranges from industry to agriculture to media technology. But if you really want one, Stalin's five-year plan is especially brutal and shows just what happens when the government is your boss, threatening state punishment for being late or screwing up. Again, 
in a twist of irony, the collectivist cause for peace and love ends up being far worse treatment of the individual than the free market ever was. Imagine living in a world where you can be put to death for not meeting your quota at work. This really was a thing back then in some cases. Any college Starbucks socialists out there still think this is a good idea? Just think working in such a wonderful environment sure is great got rid of all those capitalist pigs. Eventually people wake up in a state that controls every aspect of their being. Welcome to George Orwell, 1984. Enjoy your stay. This, in a nutshell, is how the totalitarian state arises from socialism. These three issues arise to add fuel to the fire that creates a constant and systemic flow of all power from the people to the state. And the more power the state gets, the more control the state has over all these aspects, making it easier and easier for them to gain more power. This is what is known as the snowball effect, which is a process that starts small and insignificant, just like how socialism often appears innocent at first and may even seem to work at the start, but then quickly grows larger as it picks up steam, since the problems that cause the effect tend to increase the problem, thus leading to a bigger effect. Similar to how a snowball rolling down a hill can start small, but as it picks up snow it grows larger and heavier, leading it to pick up more snow and grow larger and even heavier and just keep on going. And in the case of totalitarianism, the only bottom to this hill is a societal collapse, as has happened to Marxist systems many times in the past. I will end this section of the video with a disclaimer here. Many of these issues have been simplified and actually are quite complicated and quite more than what I have just gone over. There are several books that can be read if you are interested in further details. It isn't necessary, but take a good look if you are curious. And now for the next section of the video, refuting common Marxist explanations for the pipeline. Of course, Marxist-Leninists have their own set of excuses for why their system keeps producing fail. If you guess that it involves blaming everyone but themselves, well, you're right, yeah, that's pretty much what they do. But let's take a look at some of the more common ones anyways. We will first start out with one that you will almost certainly find just about everywhere when dealing with Marxian economicists, which is a Mott and Bailey tactic. Mott and Bailey policies are named after an old style of castle that had a bailey, which was where most of the castle was located, and a Mott to retreat to that is easier for them to defend. As a fallacy, it is used to describe when a person dishonestly misrepresents their own views, kind of like a reverse straw man almost, by retreating to a less extreme and often completely different idea to the one that they were originally saying and defending, represented by the Mott. Whenever they are called out on the extremist views that they actually hold, represented by the Bailey, they will then pretend that their successful defense of the Mott counts as a successful defense of the Bailey, even though they are two completely different views. The Marxist-Leninists will generally set up European mixed markets with strong welfare state safety nets that don't actually follow Marxist ideology as a mod, and actual Marxist countries or ideologies as the Bailey. They will then claim that because, say for example, Norway, Denmark, or Portugal is not a totalitarian dictatorship, then this whole charge against Marxism is flawed and the Bailey is A-OK. -okay. The flaw in this argument is that these countries are not actually Marxist-Leninists. In Portugal, the PSD party follows liberal conservatism and has denounced Marxism. Their actual socialist party did have some ties to Marxism many decades ago, but now considers itself center-left. Or in the case of the Scandinavian countries, they are even further to the right to Portugal, following social democracy, which is just capitalism with a welfare safety net, and has nothing to do with Marxism. A good example of this is Richard D. Wolff in a roughly 10 minute long rant about Venezuela, you know, not true socialism, where he retreats to the Mott by bringing up Portugal, in hopes that we will all forget about his Bailey, which includes the fact that he is a full-blown Marxian economicist who believes that all profit is theft, despite the fact that this concept is in stark contrast to how the Portuguese economy is actually run. A similar argument to the Mott and Bailey is one that takes more of the form of a false comparison, where they will take Marxist ideology and compare it to non-Marxist ideology as if it's the same thing, such as, oh hey, most people already accept that the government takes some of your profits as taxes for social programs already, so why not just let the government control company ownership too? Or in other words, hey, you already accept this much government, so now you have to accept this much government, otherwise you're contradicting yourself, because they're totally the same thing somehow. No, it, it, just no. Next up is the good ol' it's the evil capitalist fault that these Marxist countries all went 1984 on us. The argument basically goes that totalitarianism is not a natural result of Marxist-Leninist ideology, but something that they were forced to adopt in order to fight against trade embargoes and wars they were fighting with free market countries. The claim is that if there were peace instead of tensions between the capitalist countries and Marxist ones, then the Marxist ones wouldn't have had to go all 1984 on us. The flaw in this argument is that it's a mixture between confusion, correlation, and causation, and flat out lying. You see, most of the dictators that were in these 
Marxist dictatorships can be found admitting to wanting totalitarianism and dreaming about it long before they gain power, to the surprise of no one. But more importantly, there is no causal link whatsoever between war and many of the totalitarian actions performed in these dictatorships. How did the capitalists force Kim Il-sung to adopt his three generations policy of punishing an entire family up to three generations, all for the crime of one person? How did the capitalists force Mao Zedong to ban free speech and murder just about everyone who spoke out against him? Same question with Fidel Castro and publicly punishing his dissenters. How did the capitalists force Stalin to kill the Kulaks and many others? And how did murdering their own people help them combat capitalism exactly? Yeah, a real big brain move there. The more questions you ask on this, the more ridiculous this argument reveals itself to be. The entire argument is essentially saying that because bad stuff happened, then nothing the Marxist dictatorships was did was their own fault, without any kind of evidence to back this statement up. It's pure victim complex nonsense. And so now we reach our conclusion. There are a lot of excuses Marxists will give for the rise of totalitarianism from their ideology, but the vast majority of time it boils down to either dishonest historical revisionism or attempts to muddy definitions and argue over semantics over just what totalitarianism and socialism is. Neither of these are ever good arguments. If you want a quick and simple shorthand explanation of all of this that you can easily give your friends, the simple answer is that you cannot fix problems caused by large corrupt entities by just giving power to a different large corrupt entity, in some vain hope that this time it will be better. Socialism fools people into funneling their power into the state because of the false god of collectivism dupes them into believing that they will be the ones in charge once it's all said and done, when in reality it's of course not going to be them in charge, it's going to be the state, for the simple fact that the state has no reason to ever give power up to a mere concept. It's not going to happen. Totalitarianism is thus the eventual logical conclusion of socialist policies as it progresses towards the unobtainable goal of communist utopia. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, feel free to share.